He's a cyclist. Bend up. Don't stand any nonsense, Paul. He's as weak as a kitten. <laughs> Paul? Okay. ALA, give me, let's put ALA on. Hold on, we've lost it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to find out, uh, just come down a little bit. Let's, let's pop, a, pop a cushion on there. Yeah. Cyclists had dead strong quads. <laughs> okay. So ALA is the first part. If you look on there, the first marker to go. So we're through the ALA. PBG, you get used to saying this after a while. Sometimes you get a bit tongue twisted. <laughs> with the with the names, so it's easier to say PBG, PBG. Okay, so he doesn't strengthen the PBG. Uh, Euro porphyrogen. Okay, so we're going down the track here, and what you'll find here is he strengthens. Okay, so where is my block? My block is between PBG and Euro porphyrogen. What does that mean? He's shunting it into the pyroles. All right. We've got a Carl Pfeiffer case here, all right? In other words, he's going to have problems. Parpers will say they are psychiatric disorders, but you know, it can be as bad as, as schizophrenia and so on, anxiety, depression, alcoholism, but it doesn't have to be. There's all sorts of learning problems, as we'll see, which are involved with this. So right, yep. yeah, just stay there. Okay. So now. Uh, let's try him on a bit of lutein, okay? We're just talking at the moment with him using the MOVE, okay? This is your quick way in. What? Hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide him, yes. Okay, so take off the, uh, the MOVE and let's put hydrogen peroxide on. Pull. Because he's got no catalase, you see. He's not producing further on. This is why it becomes dangerous in the brain, particularly with kids, because they, they have real problems with it. So, Lutein. We're going to put lutein. Now, lutein is a carotenoid. Okay, it's extracted from yellow marigolds commercially, or yellow nasturtium flowers. Okay, that's where it's commercially extracted from. For us, the richest source of it is kale. So kale is a wonderful source of lutein. If you leave kale a couple of extra days in the fridge, it goes yellow. Okay. The green is the chlorophyll. That oxidizes off, the older it is, and then it goes yellow, and that's the lutein. That's when it's really at its best, is when it's off. So lutein here works extremely well. Okay. Try the zeaxanthin. Zeaxanthin is uh, the orange component. So that comes from orange nasturtium flowers and orange marigolds. This is more for the macula of the eye. Okay. Yes. Okay, so what we should find is that uh, zeaxanthin doesn't work, okay? Now, if zeaxanthin had worked, I would suspect we might be getting damage to the macula, all right? Now you're beginning to say, ah, you get hydrogen peroxide with this light into the macula of the eye, you'll destroy it, won't you? You'll oxidize the macula, the cones. What's that called? Macular degeneration, isn't it? Okay. Everybody's been barking up the wrong tree. What it is, it's the light that's causing this because these people have got pyroles or pyrourea or porphyria. Okay, they're sensitive to the light. Okay. Now we know some people, Sam, don't we, who can't go into a shop because certain lights in the shop upset them and other lights are fine. And that particular shop was a supermarket, which if you go to chain of shops, they all use the same lighting system. Okay. Have anybody else ever been exposed to that? Where well, you don't like the light in an area, but you go into another one. You see, most of the energy saving bulbs now are mercury vapor, and mercury is at 440 nanometers. So it's not an arm's length away from that. It may not be that one, but on the other hand, there are certain lights which people don't like and react to. Okay. So we know that with Mark, we come in at the end of the chain. We said he's got pyrrole, porphyria or pyrrole urea because he weakens to the mauve. This would be the quick way in. Okay? The long way in would be to go through the procedure with everything else, but at the end of the day, does he strengthen to oxygen? And if he strengthens to oxygen, does he strengthen to hemoglobin, phospholipids, or CoQ10? Okay? And treat accordingly. But your way of analyzing what it is is to do ALA, PBG, uroporphinogen, coproporphinogen, and, and work your way down. Okay. Now, if you stay there, one of the things I found, this one, that coproporphinogen, uh, here, uh, in blue people, only blue people, 
causes migraines. So I found that people with migraines, and most of those are blur, have high levels of coprophenogen. So when they're exposed to light, well, they create the radicals at the back of the eye, which gives them the zigzaggies on the nerve endings there and produce it. Now, if you can take that out, then a lot better. And that's why uh, the lutein really helps these people. So if we've got some lutein, what we'll do is just show you. And the reason I like using the lutein is not only to protect the eyes, and there may be other compounds in addition to lutein that will do this. You know, I had great hopes that turmeric would do it. But turmeric, I find, is too orange. You know, turmeric used to be yellow. When you put turmeric into rice, it goes yellow. But when you buy it, it's got an orangey look. And that doesn't work. It doesn't seem to <laughs> test in the same way. But lutein works really well. It is, isn't it? Yes, I found that. Commercially, is much, and I think it's when it goes dry and old, it goes more, yet more uh, orangey colour. We're going to try and get some fresher, organic. Um, yeah. So what we'll do now is we'll just pop, this is in the clear, um, pop one capsule. Now, the capsule contains 250 milligrams of lutein, okay, and 250 milligrams of kale, organic kale. Okay, so it's good stuff. And when I've used um, half quantities here, 250 of each, they work exactly the same. So eating kale is great. That's the good news. The bad news is you lose 50% of it if you cook it. So it has to be in a smoothie sort of form. You can eat it cooked, but you don't get so much value out of it. So this tells me roughly how much hydrogen peroxide is influenced in, the, in here. So if we do one, it's no good. Okay? So we do two. We do three. I'll tell you in a minute what our champion is. And that's a healthy person. Well, they thought they were healthy at the seminar. Four. So he can eat a diet now of curly kale, <laughs> take the lutein, or try and find out something else. I think we're, go we're getting there, Mark. One more. Now, that's a reasonable slug. Uh, three. That's six lutein to try and protect him. That's quite a lot, isn't it? So in other words, if Mark goes out in the bright light there, because the level of the violet is much higher outside than it is inside, remember King George went mad outside, okay? He was all right indoors, okay? So when you go outdoors, you increase the porphyrin level and the oxidation from the light Hicks effects and creates more hydrogen peroxide, which does more destruction to your brain and your eyes than anything else. So when you go out, you need six to protect your eyes. So th the next thing you ask the patient to this is, how are your eyes? Um, I'm finding that effect hit me about a few years ago. That I couldn't read the newspaper in an aeroplane because of the seat in front. Yes. And that's when I had to get, get glasses. So what he's saying is he couldn't read the newspaper in front in an aeroplane because he couldn't push the person in front far enough away. It's because you didn't travel business class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> if you're Virgin or, 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 or Ryan, you're right up there. Okay, so that you begin to notice it. Why does it occur? They say, oh, it's because of age. You see an optician and they say, well, as you get older, your lens crystallizes. And therefore, it can't change its shape to focus in. That is generally, I would say, rubbish. Because if I go outside, I can read. Does my lens change from being crystalline to soft again? No, they do it to sell you glasses. Okay? I knew that ages ago, that if you go in the bright light, you can read. And I bet you can as well. Yeah. That's your pupillary light reflex. Okay? What operates the pupillary light reflex? When the bright light is, do your pu does your pupil constrict so you can focus in? And the answer is, not in dim light it doesn't. But in bright light it does still. Okay? What do you like driving at night? Do bright lights coming towards you? Are they, have you noticed that they're brighter than what they used to be? Probably. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you're honest, people are ah, I'm imagining, perhaps it's the halogen bulbs are getting brighter. But it's not. It's your pupil isn't constricting as much when the light comes towards you. And so these are all first signs. You don't know, 98% or 99% of the um, receptors in the back of your eyes are rods. A very small, one or two percent of the cones. When we see color vision there, it's really just a film on the front of the black and white, if you like, screen. And we can lose loads and loads and loads, and you won't know you've lost them. You won't have no idea that you've lost them until your pupillary light reflex doesn't work so well, and then gradually it deteriorates. 
Now the next stage from that, of course, is that the oxidative damage done to that can affect the, the lens itself, so you can develop cataracts. It can affect the trabeculae, the little tunnels between the vitreous humor and the aqueous humor, in which case that's called glaucoma. It can cause damage on the back and you can get detached retina, and if it affects the macula, you get macular degeneration. So you begin to see, oh, all these visual problems are actually problems related to light and trying to protect ourselves from the damaging light re reaction, which is at 400 nanometers. So more yellow is the answer, but he w Lucy will never cure him. Okay, his problem is not going to be something involved with taking lutein to the cure. It'll do a blotting paper job on his eyes. It'll help, and I would suggest in the short term that he took lutein to protect his eyes from getting any worse. What will stop that is, of course, opening this pathway up. So let's see, um, he had PBG, didn't he? So he, we need to take him from, um, let's go back one on that. We need to take him from PBG did we do PBG? So we'll do PBG in the clear with him, because remember, PBG should weaken, and europorphinogen strengthens, is what we saw. So I, I'll just keep those there. Okay, PBG. So PBG, are we all with me on the piece of paper? PBG. So PBG weakens, okay? Okay, now you won't find taking lutein will make any difference to PBG. He can take all he wants, okay? That won't cure him. The only thing that will cure him is to open that pathway up. This will help protect his eyes, which is very, very important. Because people with high levels of PBG, for instance, you know, when they've got um, learning disorders, will have visual problems. Some people, you're a specialist in this, you know that they can't see properly. Sometimes there's bits missing in the words. They call it dyslexia, don't they? It's the aberrations because they've got hyper-excitatory toxins in there because PPG is an excitotoxin. Okay, so let's give him P5P. So the question now is, which one does he need to get over the high PBG? Is it pyridoxal 5-phosphate? No. Okay, uh, now let's give me tetrahydrobioptrin. That's one of your favorite words. H4 bioptrin. Pull. H4 bioptrin. Okay, now go and get some H4 bioptrin and let's measure him as to how much he needs. So H4 bioptrin is a type of folic acid, uh, yes, a type of folic acid. We're going to have a look at it in a minute, what it's made from. Um, it's a rather complex process of making it, but it's a hydroxylation um, coenzyme. It's something which hydroxylates compounds. It hydroxylates tryptophan to make 5-hydroxytryptophan to making serotonin. It hydroxylates tyrosine to make L-dopa, phenylalanine to make tyrosine, and I think to do proline, to make um, hydroxyproline for making collagen. Okay, so how many does he need? This is the next question. Okay, so let's try him on one, two, three. So we need three. So if we put that away, so what you'll find is the three tetrahydrobioptin will negate the mauve <coughs> because that's the cause, okay? So he's got a genetic um, uh, polymorphism for not being able to activate enough tetrahydrobioptin. This is where his, his issue is. He's not deficient in lutein. Do you understand that? Okay? Lutein will help him with his eyes. It'll act as a blotting paper to protect him from the light. Lutein will never have solved King George, but he might have been able to go out and protect his eyes. Now, not only is it the eyes, but it's everywhere you're exposed to with the, with the mauve. So this could be on the skin. Okay, so he will weaken to anywhere where the light, even the light in this room, is enough for him to weaken. So you can put the mauve anywhere. I start with the eyes because people are very, very grateful when you talk about eyes because they're very worried. You know, when somebody has taken some interest in their eyes and can perhaps offer an explanation as to why their eyes aren't so good, it's worth everything. So you can do that. Now, if we don't expose him to the light and we cover him over, cover the mauve over there and test him, he's nice and strong, okay? So if he was to walk around in the dark, he'd be wonderful. 
but the lighter it is and the more outdoors, the greater the intensity of the mauve. All right? Now, in the moment, we're intensifying it because we're putting that there. Okay? Um, but put you outside in the bright light, there'll be enough mauve in there to cause problems. You should always use something which is yellow to help protect the eyes. Sam has found some nice um, glasses, haven't you, with a yellow tint, which is very successful. Uh, in a shop, big departmental store where it begins with D and ends with M. <laughs> okay. uh, and they, w they worked really well, I think. And they cost about 20 pounds, I think. And they even he's muscle tested them. He muscle tested throughout the store. <laughs> um, and came up to the conclusion that these glasses were very, very good. So you probably do need to wear sunglasses when it's really bright. Okay? Probably, obviously not indoors, or, but if you're out at the beach and that sort of thing. Okay? So we've come to Mark in a different way, because Mark, we, we sort of saw the end just to find somebody, and I chose him just because he uh, was wearing glasses. All right? um, and that was it. So everybody who wears glasses, I will guarantee, I put my money on, will weaken to the mauve. Okay? It's the first signs of deterioration in the body when you have to start wearing glasses. Okay? So it's time to do something about it. Okay? Now, it may not make your vision come back. You know, that's the sad thing, because you may have lost enough rods that you've done. But it may slow down the process to more what it should be. All right? I remember talking to Dr. Goddard um, when he was in his 70s, um, Don McDowell and myself, and we said, well, you, George, you don't seem to wear glasses for anything. And he said, no, he said, when I was your boy's age, because he called us boys in those days when we were 45, and he said, when I was your age, I started this nonsense, he said. And he said, the main thing is never wear glasses, because once you do, your eyes will accommodate it, and they don't work then, and they continue. So he worked on his eyes, he did lots of things for it, including wearing pinhole glasses and all sorts of things. And he said, but he said, uh, he said Chris, there's a secret to it all. And I said, what's that? He said, he whipped out this pen torch, you see, and he said, it's small, you know, it's, it's this size. And he said, you take this to the restaurant with you. <laughs> and he said, when you're reading the menu and it's dark, you just get your pen torch. And lots of people do that now. They take a pen torch. And I find that's essential for not just the menu sometimes, but for the bill. <laughs> because the, uh, the credit card printout it seems to be greyer these days. I don't know, is it grey or is it just me? But it looks grey and it's on an off-white paper. And sometimes threes and eights and nines and so on are very difficult to distinguish. But the pen torch or somebody else's pair, somebody else's eyes is, is good in that sort of sense. Which is great because Jill's short-sighted and I'm long-sighted, so between us we get on all right. <laughs> okay, so a little pen torch is the ideal there. Okay, so w maybe we'll have you back a bit later. So I would suggest, if you're really worried about yeah. the eyes, um, to use the lutein for the short term, all right? Now, we may need to try and find out the cause of the inflammation, why it's so bad. Because the mauve is aggravating the existing problem. And the existing problem is he's got a polymorphism, you know, as a SNP, associated with the enzymes which use tetrahydrobiopsin. So by taking the tetrahydrobiopsin, that's the real cause and the, the genetics. So you upgrade um, a lot of the, um, the problems that you might have or, or could potentially have. Now, tetrabioptin is a very unstable substance, so it has to be made in the body. So we call it tetrahydrobioptin factors. So we put all the things together to get it to make. Right? You don't make tetrahydrobioptin um, and put it in a pot, because it doesn't last like that for you know, more than days. So you have to make it. So you give the raw components, and then the body will make it itself. Right? So let's have a look. Um, I mentioned about migraines. There's a whole host in here of issues. And you'll find these once you get into this. Uh, along this line is where heart disease comes in. Further down there with the protoporphins is where cancer comes in. We know all these diseases are associated with hypoxia. It just depends on where in the hemoglobin porphyrin chart that you start to pick them up. Okay, if I go back here, uh, uh, this one with the PBG definitely produces an enormous amount of problems. Uh, with people, and these are, tend to be more on the emotional front and learning difficulties, neurological problems. <coughs> so hemoglobin is composed of heme, which we've talked about briefly how we make it, with one uh, ferrous iron and a globulin protein composed of 141 amino acids and 145 beta in the beta chain. 
Uh, that's the main ones there. Myoglobin. Now, myoglobin is the muscle cells store oxygen in the resting state as oxymyoglobin, and on exercise, they release the oxygen. So myoglobin is the way the body stores oxygen in the muscle. Okay, so it's ready to dissipate the uh, oxygen as required. It is composed of the same amino acid as acids as in hemoglobin. So that's myeloperoxidase, which we talked about. Now, let's just do this one. Thyroid peroxidase, or thyroperoxidase, is an enzyme expressed mainly in the thyroid that liberates iodine for addition into tyros uh, for addition onto tyrosine residues on the thyroglobulin for the production of T4 and T3 thyroid hormones. Now, this again is taken from uh, Harper's. So we take in iodine from our diet. Here we see iodine with the negative on it. And then on the top here, we've got iodine with the negative. And then this is peroxidased to make iodine with a plus on it. Okay, that means it loses an electron in the process. And to do that, it needs peroxide. And this peroxide is produced here in the thyroid gland by an enzyme called the peroxidase, or thyroperoxidase. And thyroperoxidase is a heme-dependent enzyme. Okay? So if you're low in heme, you can't ionize iodine to attach it to the tyrosine to make T3, well, to T1 and T2, which will go on then to make T3 and T4. Just try it, because you'll see, you'll be amazed, that people with hypothyroids, we may be barking at the wrong tree because we may not have tested them with the right substances. So the right substance might be iodine, to test them with, with hydrogen peroxide. And when you start doing that, you then produce something much more powerful. In other words, they're unable to activate the iodine. So I'm experimenting at the moment using liquid iodine and mixing with peroxide to change it so that it has a negative charge on it. And it might be much more efficient than the other seaweed extracts, etc., which are, are, are positive. Um, or just put hydrogen peroxide and the iodine together, and hey presto, see how many people with thyroid problems improve. I'm not suggesting you give them hydrogen peroxide, but give them the peroxidase and uh, iodine. Okay, so let's just have a quick look through pyrolurea. You know, was those increased pyrroles like we found with Mark is known by many names. Cryptopyrrole is what it used to be. Uh, pyrolurea, pyrrole disorder, Mo factor. Uh, it can best be described as abnormal synthesis and metabolism of oxygen-carrying molecule of hemoglobin. Um, it's now known to be hydroxyhemopyrrolin or HPL. Here it is, the Mo factor itself. Um, you note the OH here, which is the addition from the PBG. Uh, in human, it's found in human urine, blood, and cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, it was called cryptopyrrole, chemically similar to cryptopyrrole. Um, so here we've got cryptopyrrole, and here we've got hemopyrrole, and you'll see literally this part is just around the other way. So it's an isomer, so it was easy of why it got confused there. So it's literally just a molecule around the other way. It was discovered in 1957, and the founder was Abram Hoffer, um, who Dr. Goodhart wrote an enormous amount about um, because he was the founder of uh, orthomolecular medicine in relation to, to psychiatric problems. Um, it's labile and elusive. Uh, it's named after the lilac colored appearance on the, on the, ga on the paper chromatography. Um, it's been involved, he found, with a lot of behavior problems, Down syndromes, schizophrenia, autism, ADDH, alcoholism. Uh, Pfeiffer, Carl Pfeiffer in the 1970s, wrote the following comments about it when they found it on the blood test, on the urine test. And this is where it becomes interesting. Now, we have a document, a little booklet, from the International College of uh, Psychiatric Medicine, which I can send to you, but we can't give it on the website because of copyright. But I will send you an email PDF of it if you ask. I don't know, have we got any around here? It's the pyrrole disorder. Um, now, Pfeiffer put down nail spots. Now, nail spots could be white spots or anyone. Used to think that was always uh, zinc, but it could be. Stretch marks, and this is interesting. These are people who haven't necessarily gained a lot of weight and lost it, like in pregnancy, but they get stretch marks. But it could be people who are pregnant and lose, and when they lose, uh, when they have the baby and, and lose the stretch, they, s they end up with the stretch marks. Okay, so stretch marks on the skin. Pale skin, they don't like the light. 
these kids and, and adults don't like the light, they'll tell you, I don't like going out there. So they tan poorly because they don't like it. They get knees and joint pains. Uh, they are often constipated or they have poor dream recall. This is a classic sign of pyridoxal 5-phosphate deficiency, is poor dream recall. So they dream because they, they still have rapid eye movement but they never remember their dreams. They have morning nausea, they, well, they definitely have low appetite in the morning. Most of them skip breakfast but they may have morning nausea, which is always a sign of P5P deficiency, isn't it? Okay. Well, they are sensitive to light and sound, they don't like loud noises and bright lights. Well, they are sensitive to odours, okay? this is because of the cytochrome P450 function is, is inhibited. Well, they suffer from migraines, that's the blue ones further down as we know, and often they get a stitch in the side, that was Carl Pfeiffer's comments back in the 1970s. Then Walsh ab, uh, added low stress tolerance. They did a lot of studies with American soldiers and put them into cold water. Doesn't sound very nice, does it? Who got this uh, pyrourea and measured them and they found the pyrourea level went up. Often uh, anxious and overly pessimistic, these people. Nothing's you know, really good and happy in the world. They're pessimistic. Sometimes they can have explosive temper uh, and they definitely get hyperactivity. Uh, Crucier uh, found social withdrawn, so this is more coming into the spectrum, as they called it, Asperger's and into uh, uh, other problems. Emotionally labelled, loss of appetite, and easily fatigued. Very little energy. Why? Because cytochrome C isn't working in the mitochondria. Abnormal fat distribution. This apparently is around the waist, so it's like a ring around the waist, and this is thought to be due to an imbalance in the hormones, maybe too much estrogen and not enough testosterone. Irritable bowel. Now why irritable bowel? This is interesting because Harper's mentions this abdominal pains and I couldn't understand why it is. It's because PBG is an excitotoxin and it causes spasms in the gut. It's a true irritable bowel. Just like if you have MSG or aspartame, some people get oh, you know, real gripes in the tummy and that's what they get with this. So they get an abdominal pain because of the high level of the excitotoxins. Delayed puberty, so often they're very tall because they get low testosterone, which means the estrogen is often very much higher, but low testosterone means they don't fuse their epiphyseal plates, so they grow tall. Okay? So very often these people are tall. Irregular periods for the girls. Overcrowded teeth, so often they've got uh, overcrowding in their narrow jaws, joint pains. Reading difficulties because of the excitation going on in the brain. Motion sickness, not much good on boats, cars, etc. Auditory processing disorder, that's the loud noises, memory loss and insomnia, craving of sugar, poor morning appetite, we mentioned frequent infections, now we know why, because myeloperoxidase, nitric oxide are low, allergies, particularly to things like gluten and lactose, uh, often impotent, uh, sweet breath and body odour, paranoia, seizures and intolerance to bright light. Apart from that, they're all right. <coughs> okay. now, Obviously, one person doesn't have all of those, <laughs> but a lot of people do. You know, I had a patient um, this week, she could have written a book, uh, and she's a practitioner. So when you recognize this in yourself, you know, come and see somebody who can go through it and help you, and also learn, and I encourage you to learn it very thoroughly, because it'll be invaluable for your patients. Because once you start to recognize this problem and its relationship to lack of oxygen, it just answers so many problems that people have got in every department. So Igar says it may well be for P450 that oxidizes hemopyrrole to cryptopyrrole, as we said. Um, hydroxyhemopyrrole 2 is either an intense chelator of B6 and zinc or it facilitates the urinary excretion. This is why these people need high doses of P5P. Okay, so uh, they usually need high doses of P5P. Uh, yours was slightly different, Mark, in so far you wanted H4 bioptrin, which does have P5P in it, but yours was a little bit more. Um, <coughs> interestingly, PBG is broken down by a deaminase enzyme uh, and the release of ammonia, from which we presume more P5P for utilizing and forming ammonia may be needed. Uh, it is not uncommon for those with this condition to have gluten and casein sensitivities. This condition is more prevalent in many of the same populations that we see increasing prevalence of gluten sensitivity. Okay, so um, let's have a think. Let's try, um, does somebody else have, uh, does anybody have a sensitivity to light that they know? Yes, you do. Okay, can we borrow it? 
Do you wear glasses? I've got contact lenses. You've got contact lenses, yeah. Okay, so it won't make any difference to our test, but uh, do you want to... And you, was that because you're short-sighted? Yes. Yes, okay. So if we start at the, you know, just to demonstrate this, I want to start at the end, if you like, rather than the beginning. Okay. Start with the bow. Yeah, just test a strong muscle first. First of all, I'm going to get out of the way. Remember, it's pretty dim in this room, um, so that Gary can film. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she's reacting very, very markedly to the mauve. Okay, so uh, another case. So if you leave the mauve on and go to, let's just run through the program. Let's do ALA. ALA. So she's, she's failed right at the beginning, okay? So what do we think of what two substances here? ALA, A for adenosyl and P5P. Okay, so we may have here got an ALA um, uh, and adenosyl, kabobi, okay. So just while we're doing this, what? Okay, let's, let's do the um, P5P. So she could be both. I don't usually find it's more than one. No? Okay. All right, so uh, let's take another case. Um, anybody else not like the light? You don't? Ah, oh, that's the sign. Come, Kevin. <laughs> Come to us. <laughs> <laughs> Joint pains, yeah. Spots on the nails. Wear three hats up in Sheffield, dear. <laughs> He's what? He's not a cyclist, no. Tour de France, not your way. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you weren't expecting it that much, were you? Okay, ALA on. So we do th do the protocol through. We're cutting corners here because I just want to sh the demonstration that you see. You can see how how we do it because you've all got a move, and you should be able to put this into practice straight away. Okay, so ALA remember is the first one. Good. So we pass the first hurdle. Okay. Uh, PBG. Yes, fast the second. Europorphinogen. Let's see how far we get. Getting, <laughs> Getting closer to madness, yeah. Yes. Okay, Copro. Okay. Are you a blue, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Yes, he's a blue. Um, let's have a look here. No, okay, he's gone past that. Protoporphyrin. It's got to be that one, or it's going to be that last phase. Uh, okay. Ah, so his problem is protoporphyrin round. So that means that he's going to shunt and make more coproporphyrin. So try coproporphyrin in the clear, um, and take his acetate off. That's it, and he should weaken to that if we got an excess of that one. Yes. Okay. So now we know where we are. Okay. Are you followed on your chart where you are? Okay. <laughs> okay. Have a look. Okay. Let me let me have that one. Um, then I can show them. Okay. So we've got to here. Okay. So he was strong to um, europorphinogen, strong to copro. Okay. Um, no, sorry. He's weak to euro, weak to copro, and then he strengthened to protoporphinogen. So we went back and he weakened to copro. Okay. So that's where the the problem is. Is number. Six. 
Okay, so that's where his defect is, number six. So we need uh, FAD of B2 and B6. Okay, so let's try him on P5P and we'll try him on B2. Uh, we, we, uh, you'll need the... Um, yeah, or, or do work with the acetate. I thought I'd like the acetate. Patients like it as well. Cause they can't believe that they can weaken to something else like that. Not P5P. Try um, riboflavin or P2. P2. Sometimes it's a folate. Riboflavin. Okay. So that's got a that's got a set. Just try him now on the um, on the uh, capsules there. So uh, the lutein. Let's see how bad he is. Um, Mark the um, the worst we've had so far is 16 capsules. 16, yeah. Of the smart ones. <laughs> Gives you hope, doesn't it? <laughs> but that, you know, the reason I, I just keep a packet, even if the person doesn't have them, prescribe them, it just gives me an idea just how bad they are. Um, because, because a person weakens to hydrogen peroxide, you don't know how bad it is. You have no idea. Six. Six. So not bad. No. But you were six, weren't you? No. Yes. Were you six? Six yeah. capsules. Yeah. So I think um, more or less the same as Mark. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Let's say, you know, most of the people we've found, you will never change from the six capsules of lutein unless you take what it is that will resolve it. So if you take the B2, the B6, whatever it is, then you will gradually get it down and down and down because the inflammatory process is getting smaller. So that, you know, is quite a moderate, a good, a reasonable amount of information going on by the fact he needs that. We don't know where it's going on, okay? He, we listen to his way. He's told us en route, he said, I've got joint pains. Okay, try him with the peroxide. We know he'll produce superoxide. He'll reduce superoxide to hydrogen peroxide, won't he? Okay, the hydrogen peroxide is what he'll reduce it to, but he can't get rid of hydrogen peroxide because he hasn't got catalase. So let's see with hydrogen peroxide. He's pouring hydrogen peroxide into his joints. Just substances that we've come across today, um, and you will find it in your practice, is just how many people are deficient in pyridoxal 5-phosphate as opposed to pyridoxine. All right? Now, one of the things I wanted to try and get to show, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll do after the tea break, is when pyridoxal 5-phosphate shows up, do we give a liquid or do we give a capsule? Okay? And what we found that by introducing natural food substances which are rich in the uh, particular nutrient, it seems the body can utilize it a lot better. So we found with certain minerals, if we use the rich source of those minerals, then it acts like celery seed is a very good natural source of zinc. So if we put zinc with celery seed, it helps to activate it. And we call those our smart range of products. Okay? So we have a smart pyridoxal 5-phosphate. And the smart pyridoxal 5-phosphate is, is, is a standard amount, 25 milligrams of pyridoxal 5-phosphate, but it's in a base of organic brown rice bran. Now, rice bran, particularly organic rice bran, is a good source of bran, but it's a very, very good source of pyridoxal 5-phosphate or the enzymes to activate B6. Now, you can do this yourself. So when you cook rice, you should cook it dry, brown rice, and cook it dry and then eat it, okay? Or use the water, if there's any water left, to take your B6 with, your pyridoxal 5-phosphate. But if you put the two together, it enhances it, so it makes it to work better. Okay, so pyridoxal 5-phosphate with brown rice will enable it to work far superior. Now, there may be another reason that Jill came up with, which seems to work very well as well, is brown rice is an insoluble fiber which absorbs a lot of fluid. So by the time you swallow the smart P5P, a lot of the P5P will get absorbed into the brown rice fiber and it will then dissipate over a longer period. So it forms a time release. So we tested this by using liquids. So with a liquid, what we found is that a person would strengthen, let's say, to 10 squirts of a liquid. And by the afternoon, they would be testing for another five or six. So they would have dropped down. All right? So with the capsule, they didn't do this. So a person takes the capsule, and for 12 hours, they didn't show that they needed another one. So it's a much more of a time release response to it. So that was an advantage of it. The trouble is, it is over a slower period, 
And there are some people who need a quick fix to get it in, and maybe they don't absorb further down in their guts, and they respond better to the, uh, to the liquid. So I wanted to show you how you determine this, which is the better one. And it's quite easy. You put the substance on. We didn't have anybody with P5P who actually showed to this at this stage, but we're hoping Sylvie will. <laughs> okay, so P5P, you put on, say, the liquid, they strengthen, all right? Then what you do is you stay with the same parameters that you've got, therapy localizing the point or using the photocardiograph, and then you go to the left side and you test the right brain. So you get the person to hum with the nutrient on, all right? And if they remain strong, you then go to the other side and get them to do the simple mathematics. If they go weak on either of those, don't use that one, okay? Because it's not working on one brain, right? If the capsule then stays strong on both sides, use the capsule, and vice versa. If the capsule weakens on one brain, then you use the liquid, all right? Does that make sense? That's the way to differentiate which one, whether to use a capsule or a liquid, all right? Very, very important, because the same substance will strengthen, hopefully, both legs or any indicator it is, but you don't know which one is the better, okay? So the advantage of the capsule with the bran is it's slow release. So smart products release much slower. Okay? So we do smart P5P, and you'll notice most of you are familiar, of course, now with our new flat packs, and that the flat packs will go actually through letter boxes, which is the great advantage. They can come in boxes of four or eight and still go through the letter box, which is fantastic. Whereas with pots, of course, that don't go through the letter box, you end up with your parcel down at the post office and you have to pick it up between 10 and 12 during the week when you're at work. Okay. So it's a real pain because we used to get so many pots sent back to us uh, which were uncollected. But with the flat packs, they work really well there. So they're veggie caps, so there's no problems with vegetarians, in a base of organic brown rice. Methylene tetrahydrofolate is an unstable compound. So again, we make it as the folate, as the factors. It's a coenzyme necessary in the methylation of DNA uh, thymine to uracil, uh, uracil into thymine uh, polymorphism was the first polymorphism discovered to be associated with breast cancer. It is naturally rich in pea leaves, beetroot grapes and cruciferous vegetables. Tetrahydrobioptrin uh, is, we put in celery seed for the zinc, magnesium, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, ATP, manganese, NADH, which is the active form of B3, and folic acid. That was the one for you, wasn't it? Tetrahydrobioptrin, uh, factors there. Tetrahydrobioptrin um, activates phenylalanine to tyrosine, tyrosine to L-dopa, tryptophan into 5-hydroxytryptophan, which goes on to make serotonin, arginine into citronine in the urea cycle, and proline into hydroxyproline, and PBG into hydroxymethylbilane, in other words, in that uh, hemoglobin pathway that we looked at. Uh, smart lutein, we talked very briefly, is a yellow-colored carotenoid found naturally in yellow nasturtiums and marigolds. It's rich in the retina of the eye, especially surrounding the rods uh, and in the skin to protect against mauve wave bands of light. So remember, this is not just the eyes, it's the skin. Remember when I showed it, and when I put it underneath uh, Mark's shirt, it didn't weaken him, but it did weaken him when it was anywhere on the face or the hands. Anywhere where the skin is exposed, you'll notice that's where you age, isn't it? Okay, you can have a look at a person's tummy, and you can have a look at the person's bottom, and they are ageless almost, okay? Look at their hands and their face, and you can almost precisely tell how old a person is. But some people age even quicker, don't they, particularly on the hands, because that's exposed to the light all the time. Okay. Can I just borrow you one moment, Mark? If I'm right here, I think one of the pathways of tetrahydrobioptrin is the hydroxylation of proline and lysine into hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine to make collagen. Okay. Now, remember the collagen test uh, is just to pull the skin on the back of the hand. So you, you hold that. Just, just tug. That's it. The skin tug. So you hold it, you pull it, and you hold it. All right? And uh, now you can let it go. Let it go. Pull. And he's strong on letting it go, which means the elastin is all right. But if you pull it, he goes, wait. Now put it on your chin. <laughs> Just tug it there. Okay. It's the same thing. It's collagen. Wherever it is, it's the pull. It gives the shape to it. Okay. Tetrahydro. Could you find me tetrahydrobioptrin? Um, so we'll do tetrahydrobioptrin, and we'll see that he can tug his skin as much as he wants now. So what he needs is a face cream full of tetrahydrobioptrin. I found um, 
by taking the, the five um, things, P5P that I need, the twang, the result was, was amazing. You know, mine, mine used to stay up like Willio there, but now it, it goes back, you know, much faster. Not perfect yet, but it's, it's getting much better every day. Okay, so now pull the back of the skin or wherever. Okay, so he's got his tetrahydra biopterin on. Take his tetrahydra biopterin off and... <laughs> It's enough to convince you, isn't it? Yeah. Do you get any muscle? You're a cyclist. Do you get any joint pains or muscle pains? Or uh, well, going up a very steep hill, I can get cramps in the quads. Cramps. Okay, so we want sort of collagen problems are uh, muscle, when muscles, the, the fibers come apart, when you wrench muscles. Uh, discs, of course, are very rich in collagen. Um, you know, history of disc problems and things are, are usually collagen defects there. Okay. <laughs>